Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the PwC Family Business Lunch Hour. Um, I can't believe that this is our uh, our sixth session that we've had uh, over the last 12 weeks. It's amazing how quickly um, time flies. Um, our session today is all about repurposing um, your business, um, and uh, we also have a, an economic update um, from our chief economist. So my name is Skalk Barnard. I'm the PwC Africa Family Business Leader. I'm joined by my colleague, Andrea Benkenstein, who uh, supports me in our Family Business Center of Excellence. And our guests today are Tom Fiegel, who is uh, an owner and a director of Reliance Clothing and Rotex Fabrics um, down in Western Cape. Tom, thank you very much for your time. Um, I know you're very busy, um, so we appreciate uh, you taking an hour out of your very busy schedule to share some of your experiences with us today. So thank you for that. Um, and we're also jo joined by Lulu Krugel, who's uh, the PwC um, Chief Economist, and she's going to give us a, a short economic update uh, entitled Way to From Here. I'm not sure whether short is going to be enough time given everything that's been happening, but um, Lulu promised that she will keep uh, to uh, 20 minutes and focus on the key things. So. Um, you have seen in our in invitation that we send out today, we used a quote from Winston Churchill. Yeah, we said, never waste a good crisis. And I think that's very, very apt in our discussion um, with Tom today. And we've seen many organizations globally that have gone through uh, this, this, this last you know, six months, who have pivoted, who have re refocused or reinvented themselves. You know, some had to do it just to survive. Um, others have been thinking of of pivoting or or repurposing themselves, and uh, this you know this this pandemic was a catalyst for them to actually do that. Um, and Tom will share with us today what they've done um, as an organisation, you know, as a textile manufacturer. I think you are one of the 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 very very few textile manufacturers in South Africa, and. You know, they were able to pivot very quickly um, at the onset of the lockdown and basically created new product lines or new business. Um, and they are emerging from this uh, as a stronger business. And in fact, they've actually created more jobs where most other organizations have cut um, on headcount. So I'm really keen to, to get to know more about that journey, Tom and uh, Andrea will 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 go through that that interview with you. Um, but before we get to that, just a bit of logistics. Um, we want to make the session as interactive as possible. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen on the right hand so side, there's a Q and A um, toggle. So if you click on that, you can ask questions at any time, and uh, either Andrea or myself will pick those questions up, and we will um, post it um, to to Tom. And um, yeah, let's uh, let's get into it. Andrea, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Golk. And uh, again, thank you, Tom, for joining us. So the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about a global lockdown. And during this time, one of the biggest things that, that we've been talking about is the all-important pivot. But what does it really mean for family businesses? In business, a pivot usually occurs when the business is requested to make a fundamental change in a product or service um, isn't meeting the demands of the market. I could refer to it as a course of correction, um, a strategic move to encourage growth, or it might, we just might call it plan B. During this pandemic and lockdown, many businesses are facing a time of economic uncertainty and it has forced um, their arm in some part to take the steps necessary to stay above water. The difference being that the pivots widely discussed are often a long-term solution, whereas this current crisis might call for a temporary pivot. Although some might find the pivot um, is actually a successful challenge in, and change. But before we dive into the details, um, Tom, let me first check in with you. Um, he will be sharing his journey so far and what he's done. So you've had a very challenging and interesting few months. Um, it's great to have you here. So please tell us about what it's been like from a personal and business perspective for the last um, four months. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. And thank you also for the invitation. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, we are a, a local South African clothing and textile manufacturer, and um, 
supply uh, big retail, um, our main customers being Woolworths, Trues, and Chini. Uh, when, uh, when our president announced um, that, that lockdown would happen, um, uh, this brought our business to a grinding halt. Uh, not only, um, obviously, production, but also uh, our, our orders were, were, were all cancelled from one day to the other whether they were manufactured, in manufacturing, or about to go into manufacturing. So uh, from, from fabric to trims and everything that goes on to garments, we were stuck with a situation where suddenly, from one day to the other, our winter order book was gone. Uh, obviously, we've got in total just under 300 staff, and, um, and we were in crisis mode. Uh, we went into lockdown, um, and uh, after three days of lockdown, um, we decided to explore avenues that we could, first of all, help sustain our business, and secondly, to see if we can help uh, assist in this, in this pandemic. Uh, one of the key factors being, you know, what do you supply uh, to assist? And uh, we identified four products that we could help supply, and that was um, uh, hospital bed sheets that might be in demand, uh, aprons, hospital aprons, hospital gowns, and lastly, uh, masks. Um, we I then brought uh, some some of my staff back in under essential services supplier um, um, permit, and uh, you know driving to work was quite eerie these first few days because the roads were completely empty, and uh, we 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 brought you know probably about six or seven staff members in, and started developing these products. Uh, we had a lot of leftover fabric from, from our cancelled orders, and um, we tried to engineer a product which we knew nothing about. Uh, we've never make, made masks before, uh, or bed sheets or gowns. Uh, we had clothing backgrounds, so gowns were probably easiest in aprons. And we, um, we, we set about researching and Googling and, uh, and and making these products. We, we, once we had products established that we thought uh, would, would suit the market, um, we had to go about um, selling the product. And uh, you know, making something is, is one thing, uh, if you've got the equipment, but selling it is a whole new thing. So we, we had to venture from our current uh, customer base, which was very limited, uh, clothing retailers, to the broader market being, you know, your general, general uh, uh, corporates and government and approached, uh, approached a number of, uh, of, these, of these facilities and, and so offered our product. We, we quite soon got traction with, um, with various customers who wanted both branded and unbranded products. So the masks you see today with branding on the side, uh, that's what we really uh, focused on. We also partnered with a company in Cape Town, who has sublimation machine and um, was able to uh, to assist us with, with branding, and uh, that company is Mike Sports, which is in the centre of Cape Town, and uh, we were set on our way. So we we set up a new business. In essence, it was quite exciting, uh, and due to having the mill in uh, as our as our uh, fabric supplier, we were also able to treat these masks with a hydrotrophic uh, finish which was on the government spec so that, you know, any water droplets would, would not uh, permeate the fabric. Um, and we opened the mill for, for a few days to have the treatments of, of our fabrics done and uh, started manufacturing and made stock as well as orders for brand new product. Initially, there was a huge rush uh, for everybody who wanted masks and we were inundated with, uh, with inquiries. Uh, and, uh, we now need to manufacture the masks. Uh, as a design center, which Reliance Clothing is, we, are rely, we rely on outsourced sewing companies, so-called CMTs, cut, make, and trim companies, to sew for us. Now, they were all at home as well, locked down. So we needed to get them on board and get them essential, essential services uh, um, uh, licenses or permits and, uh, and get them running, which, uh, which many of them did. Uh, some were afraid because obviously they, uh, there was a great fear of, 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 of COVID and, um, and uh, everybody measured in place, uh, sanitizing and, and, uh, and masks and everything was, 
was put in place at these factories to be able to comply. And uh, the factories within a week or two started, started running and manufacturing masks. Uh, and over the last uh, three months, we probably manufactured half a million masks. We were able sure. to uh, reduce our, our, our uh, stock holding of fabrics substantially and, uh, and thereby generate a bit of cash flow, which was, um, was important. Uh, I wouldn't say that we've made money, but I'm sure we've, we've turned money and we've uh, made cash flow, which, which in this critical period was probably more important. And also provided jobs to, to the people of South Africa. So that's amazing. Um, thanks so much for sharing, Tom. Uh, so how quickly was it between uh, from designing, making the decision to having your first mask basically in your hand and sending an order um, out to your clients? Okay, so designing and making the first mask was very quick. It was uh, a day or two. Uh, I wouldn't say that the mask was by any, any means perfect. Uh, so that probably took another week to, um, to come up with um, the, the best fit and the best model. And, um, and then we, 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 we basically then designed three different types of masks at three different price points uh, and uh, all triple layered um, because that was also a government requirement time and and probably within the next with within the first uh, 10 days we had our first uh, orders and and then we were giving 10 day turnaround time for branded masks on, on orders and, and that then that then rolled from there wow <laughs> that is really amazing um, so for the people on the call uh, for the audience uh, if you want to maybe share your your journey or if you change something significantly you can just drop it in the Q&A and, and I'll be able to pick it up. It would be quite interesting to see what other people have done. Um, so as companies consider the future, they are eager to rebuild and enhance revenue streams. So most CFO surveyed in our last CFO poll survey believe offering a new and enhanced product or service will be most important um, to this pursuit, underscoring the fact that innovation will be a driving factor during the recovery period. Another area of importance will be changing pricing strategies by increasing or decreasing prices or offering different payment terms, as well as exploring alternative distribution strategies, um, such as changing from in-person to virtual sales or delivery. Uh, so, Tom, what has your approach been? Um, what changes have you made to your strategy during this time? Uh, so, I mean, the biggest change obviously was to, to, to embark upon a new product range, which we've developed uh, in terms of uh, our, a number of factors has, uh, have, have contributed to the situation we are in the moment, and that is that uh, pre-lockdown, the, the RAND also devalued substantially, um, which, which means that importing garments becomes more expensive, uh, which, uh, which resulted in retailers also refocusing their buying approach uh, too local, which, as I said, has played into our hands a little bit. So, um, uh, post post uh, strict lockdown, when when we when when retailers could open again, uh, they they started re refocusing their uh, their their buying more to local, and and I must say we 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 have picked up a lot of orders uh, as a result of that, uh, and we are currently um, our mass production has has continued, albeit at a much, much lesser level. The demand obviously is, uh, has, has declined, but our garment and fabric production has, has increased and we are at healthy levels, uh, which we are you know, very, very happy about at the moment. Um, even, even so far as uh, going forward to next winter, it looks like um, retailers are again focusing on, on, uh, on locally bought product. Um, for a number of reasons, and those reasons really are, as I said, um, the, the the rand and the exchange rate. Uh, firstly, secondly, um, speed to market. We are local and we are quick, and we are able to um, to turn around product a lot quicker than out of the east. Um, we we offer a uh, a thirty five day uh, turnaround, uh, and the same product out of China or out of the east would would take a lot longer uh, three four five months um 
So those are the, those are the key factors. Uh, and finally, I think, which is also a contributing factor, is that that the ports in South Africa are congested simply because they are operating at 30% at capacity or 50% capacity. And whenever there are COVID cases uh, in the port authorities, it slows down even more. So many, many retailers have had issues getting their product uh, out of uh, uh, offshore uh, or you know, be it the East or even, uh, even Mauritius, simply because the, the ships aren't docking and, uh, and the retailers can't, can't uh, get their products into store. Uh, so those are really uh, the factors that, that, that uh, are contributing. And we've, um, we've aligned our business, as I said, for years already to um, on the quick response side of things or, or fast fashion. Wonderful. So, so Andrea, if I, if I can come in there, Tom, thanks for sharing that. And um, it's fantastic to see how you were able to pivot so quickly and make decisions so quickly. Um, I'm interested to, and, f and for our audience benefit, um, you know, family businesses, you know, to understand, you know, in your business, you know, which is a family business, I mean, I, I didn't share it in the beginning, but you took over the business from your dad um, uh, a number of years ago, or the business that he started. Um, you know, decision making here was obviously critical and quick decision making. So, do you have in your organisation um, a family constitution that has delegated that authority to you, or how does the setup work within, um, you know, in your organisation from a governance perspective, in particularly, you know, with other family members that may not necessarily be involved in the business but have an interest in the business? Um, yeah, so I. Uh... There are, there are two main families that have the, the majority control in the business. Um, and uh, as the chairman of, of, of our group, I, I represent both families. And I must say, I have full support uh, from, from, from these two families, one of them being, being my own family. Uh, and uh, the other family being offshore. Um, uh, yeah, so they, 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 they um, with regards to operational uh, requirements, I, uh, I, 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 um, it's pretty autonomous. Uh, that being said, um, the two other partners in the business uh, are, are operational as well, and um, I work very closely with them. And uh, it's uh, the three of us, the three operational partners, um, make the decisions. And, and um, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty much. Um, uh, controlled by by the three active partners. Very interesting. Um, so if we go back to, to your customers and suppliers. Uh, what changes in behaviour have you noticed, and and how did you adapt? Okay, so as I said, um, after lockdown, there's been a there's been a, a push for for local um, from our from our from our customer, our clothing customer. And that, uh, that, that obviously benefits us, uh, being a 100% local manufacturer. Uh, and I see that quite positively. So I'm, I'm quite upbeat about uh, our business uh, going forward. I think, uh, yeah, being local and being quick and being, uh, yeah, creating employment is, is hugely beneficial. And it seems like the retailers currently are, are, um, are on the same page, which is, which is hugely positive. Yeah, that's fantastic from uh, um, taking the positive out of COVID uh, situation. Yes. <laughs> so, um, cost containment remains the top financial action executives are considering as a result of the pandemic, with nearly two thirds of respondents considering deferring or cancelling planned investments. Among those planning to halt investment, the most common areas for potential cuts remain facilities and general capital expenditure, um, expenditure operations and workforce investment. Um, so, with your company changing its approach, like I said, seeing COVID as an opportunity rather than as a threat, um, where have you been focusing your investment expenditure? So, I wouldn't see COVID as an opportunity. Uh, I'd, I'd see it as a threat. Uh, it certainly is a threat. And uh, I think uh, we're just on the lucky side of things at the moment. Um, and the, the, the requirements at the moment are for us to, to upskill and, 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 and employ. Um, and we have have employed people in the last uh, four to five weeks um, simply because of increased demand. Uh, that being said, um, pre-COVID, we actually um, retrenched some staff because we, we were looking at a, at a very soft winter. 
which is which is a blessing in disguise again because our winter was exceptionally soft due to COVID as well. So by by um, by being proactive on that approach, we we actually um, we we reduced our, our exposure, uh, and now we we need to we need to increase it again and 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 get get um, get some skills on board again. Okay, I understand. Um, and then from a remote the remote working policy and procedures, um, how have you uh, gone about it? So, so initially, um, um, we obviously had a very small team um, in, in the design center. We've got um, uh, approximately 85 staff. And uh, initially, we, uh, during, during the, uh, the, the strict lockdown, we, were, we only had about 10 or 12 staff in. Uh, and um, obviously had all procedures in place. Uh, we were consulted by, by a, a, a doctor who led us through the process. Um, as, as lockdown eased and as our, um, um, our requirement for staff in, increased, we, we, we um, put all the, the health um, measurements in place, screens and uh, scanning, checking, sanitizing, we have uh, continuous um, staff interaction where we advise staff on on the importance of washing hands and so on and so forth. Um, in terms of our approach towards uh, our our staff and how we remote remote work, uh, we we encourage our staff that are that are older older than sixty, and we have quite a few uh, to work from home wherever possible. So our FD, our accounts people, uh, where they can, they do work remotely. We've set up um, printers, oh, sorry, computers, and and um, uh, at their at their houses, and uh, that that works quite well. Uh, unfortunately, in our business, it is a very interactive business where you're dealing with with product that you need to hand to handle and feel and and uh, and show and fit. And um, so there, we 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 do have quite a few staff on site. Uh, and we have had a few COVID cases which we've dealt with as well uh, and that have self-isolated. So it is a difficult phase that we go through, uh, but um, as much as possible, we do encourage working remotely uh, for the skills that, that are able to do so. So Tom, on the, just, just on your, your industry, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, that this pandemic has sort of um, you know, pushed people to focus more on local and you know that's fantastic for our local economy but you know, we will eventually come out of out of this um, you know the east will come up with new ways of getting product out quicker do you how sustainable do you think um, you're know, buying local or buying local that has been caused by the pandemic you know, is do you do you do you think we'll go back to you know, large organizations wholesaling out of Asia, or do you actually think it might go the other way that you know, they will support more local as a, as a result? That's a good question. Thank you for that question. So the last 20 years have seen the textile industry in South Africa become decimated. Uh, I mean, Cape Town used to be, used to employ over 100,000 people in the clothing industry, and we're down to a tenth of that, if that. Um, our business, uh, the only reason why we've survived is for two key factors. The one being we're quick, so we, 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 our mill is able to um, turn product very quickly, and fashion is all about colors and qualities and, 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 and um, fabric feeling. So we, we are able to, uh, for our customers, turn product very quickly. Uh, and as an example, you know, some of our customers are paying very, very high um, square meter rates in the malls. And you don't want product in, in store that doesn't sell. So you'd rather, when we have programs where we, where we pre season test product with our customers, where they, they have you know, five different products in five different colors, and they test this product. And if the product sells well, a certain color and a certain style, then they'll repeat that with us. And they'll repeat that in season. And by doing that, they're able to put the right product, which they've tested into store that they know sells well, and that's in demand. You can't do that out of the East. So that's sort of the, the, um, 
the, the niche we've carved out to go out for ourselves. Uh, in terms of how sustainable it is, well, you know, it's been sustainable for the last you know, 10, uh, 10 years it's been doing it. Um, the current peak in demand, well, I, I don't know. Um, I hope that the retailers have realized that um, local is, is, is to be supported. Uh, we, we keep the money in the country. Um, it goes around, comes around. And, uh, and uh, there is, there's a benefit. Uh, there are huge benefits in buying local for the economy. Uh, and let's hope that, that it's not all only governed by the price you pay. Obviously, local can be a bit more expensive simply because our labor rates are higher than, than, uh, than what they are in China. Um, and uh, that's so we'll have to wait and see. I think for the next year, we'll look forward to a relatively buoyant future in terms of the clothing and textile industry. Uh, and I do hope it's sustainable. Definitely. Um, I'm just going to open another poll. So if you go on the call, you can start completing it. Um, so the meaning of the term digital transformation has changed profoundly in the recent years. While it was initially seen as an um, optional value adding exercise or a way to boost efficiency, it has now become an unavoidable and deeply transformative exercise for every business. It impacts every single aspect of the business and in combination, a rapid pace of change and ongoing advances in innovation and technology means that digital transformation is now one of the biggest transformational challenges in business history. The challenge is especially great since family businesses often less about what they do, but more about who they are. So Tom, in your businesses, um, have you automated any functions or processes in the last year or has it been on your agenda? Oh yes, definitely. Um, so um, digital transformation is, uh, is obviously a, a broad, broad term um, and, we, and it's, it's multifaceted in our business. Uh, and it begins with uh, our whole IT system in terms of production planning and, uh, and uh, you know, from our, from our sample room all the way through to our deliveries. Uh, that's, that's, you know, moved on from the days of Excel spreadsheets uh, to a fully fledged uh, design house um, system. Um, it moves on to um, a, uh, a software that we bought um, and are utilizing with regards to moving our pattern making from um, the old sort of cardboard cutout uh, systems to, to uh, digital pattern making where you can do all the way to 3D modeling, which is a big exercise. Um, and, you know, it improves your efficiency multifold, uh, multiple, you know, multiple times. Um, then all the way through to uh, our, our so-called ratings. And ratings are your fabric efficiency that you utilize. And there again, we, we bought software that, that, that automates that process and, and makes your production lay a lot more efficient. I'm hoping not to become too technical. Uh, but um, but uh, even, even on to um, uh, websites and, 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 and points of sale online. So we, we, we're venturing uh, down that road. We've got a small range of, of um, retail quality products that we manufacture and, and market on a, on a website. So that, um, that, that really is a, is a change and a, a way forward. Um, whereby I must say our, our digital, our digital online presence is 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 an area where we need to uh, certainly improve, and we, we need to focus on going forward. I must say, I usually Google someone or a company before <laughs> I interview them, and I couldn't find a lot. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, you, won't find, you won't find much on Reliance Clothing or Rotex Fabrics, um, and the reason for that is because we are so so. Um, retailer centric in south africa and the retailers know us so mm. um, you know woolworths cruise at uh knows knows who we are and they have our telephone numbers so that that's really who we, we cater for in, in large um we have a website called rag store um .za, which is which is our our small clothing range which we have pre-made pre-manufactured products so that's the one we're trying to promote going forward i'll definitely go have a look <laughs> uh, so to confront the disruption of climate change, um, governments and businesses alike will have to re-envision energy and climate policy and make investments to reduce their carbon footprint. 
uh, which will have a beneficial effect on providing investments for new jobs. So Tom, from, from your perspective, do you have a strategy in place when it comes to sustainable business practices? Um, yes, definitely. So um, sustainability goes hand in hand with, 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 with cost efficiency. Uh, and generally, when, when the two go hand in hand, they make sense and they become important. Uh, unfortunately, that's the reality of, our, of the world we live in. Um, but there are so many, so many products out there that, uh, that uh, allows us to, to improve both from a sustainability advantage and from a cost, cost advantage. And uh, my, my, my background goes, um, when, I, when I was in my 20s, I, I was involved in a business in the, in the UK that, that I started, which uh, had the patent rights for a waterless urinal system. And um, uh, that's going back quite a while. But we, uh, we, we, we introduced a, a water-saving device to the UK and built that up and then eventually sold the business. Uh, and similarly, in, in, at, at Rotex, we, we have um, all our hot water from our dye, dye machines is, is recycled and we preheat uh, cold water with the, with the 90 degree water from the, from the dye house and, and up to 70 degrees. So that's, 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 a, that's a great uh, cost saving. Our, our machines are all uh, low liquor ration machines, meaning we use very little water. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, dye houses generally use a lot of water, but our, our systems are, we reduce our water consumption by, by uh, 60 or 70 percent. Uh, and there are, there are um, you know, motion sensor uh, detectors in, in, uh, where, we, where we reduce uh, light, uh, light in areas we don't, uh, we don't need light in. We've, we've actually redesigned our roofs of our, of our buildings to allow natural light in whereby years ago it had no natural light. Uh, that, of course, you know, reduces your uh, electricity consumption considerably. Uh, on, the, on the Reliance clothing side, likewise, we, um, we're about to introduce a solar system, 50 kilowatt uh, solar system that we would use to run our, run our business. Um, and, uh, and we have, obviously, uh, water-saving devices and all taps and, and uh, other water-consuming devices. Sure, you actually do quite a bit. <laughs> well done. <laughs> as, I, as I said, you know, as much as I'd like to be green, um, green does certainly make sense when you when you're able to save costs at the same time. And mm -hmm. and solar, we have solar on other buildings, uh, which we which we which we own, and um, those are those are fantastic fantastic energy um, producing um, systems. So are these in line with your um, business values? Because some, some businesses, sustainability is one of their values. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, we, the more we, we can, we, we can um, uh, contribute to being environmentally friendly, the, the better. Uh, as I said, our mill is certainly uh, cutting edge in terms of uh, worldwide manufacturing uh, in sustainability. Uh, which we're very proud of. Uh, and um, we even go so far as in our clothing company, all our, um, our off-cut fabric pieces, <coughs> we, we, we donate to, uh, to charities who then go and make uh, blankets and filler for, uh, for various, uh, various quilts. And, and, and so that, that's, that's in place as well. So we try and utilize as much as possible uh, we, we have um, separation of, uh, of um, um, recycling materials, which, which, we, which is collected on a daily basis, uh, not on a, on a, on a bi-weekly basis, sorry, actually a truck outside at the moment collecting. Um, so yes, we, we, we certainly, one of our key factors is, is uh, sustainability. Wonderful. Um, so out of everything you've mentioned, what, will you think, what do you think will stick in the long run? In terms of what sustainability? Um, sorry, out of this whole discussion, like benefits um, that you've noticed in your business as a re result of the pandemic. Um, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, 
what will be okay so i think that our our i think that our team has realized how important it is to work together and to to help each other uh, i think it's been a huge growth in terms of our our business uh, and how quickly we've been managed to transform and all players have identified that and appreciate that and it's made it's made our, our business community within our business uh, stronger and i think that is a factor that hopefully uh, will remain in, in our in our in our teams and our staff's minds that we manage to support each other through this process Mm, that dream work, ah, teamwork, teamwork, <laughs> teamwork, <Teamwork's> and, <laughs> <laughs> and working together. Sure, thanks so much, Tom. It was extremely interesting, and um, again, well done on everything you've accomplished and and for sharing your story. Um, you can stay on on the call, obviously, and we we're going to keep the questions, the Q and A, open. So if anybody has any questions, uh, but we're going to hand over to Lulu now for economic. Um, updates and just what you see and what's going to happen going forward. Lulu, over to you. More and more that we're seeing advantages for businesses. And also, uh, we spoke about supply chain and changing of suppliers and, and local content. And I think what we've seen globally is that, um, you know, these, even before COVID, we saw this uh, focus on economies turning inward and countries turning inward and almost um, a fracturing of some of these relationships. And what that has been driven before COVID mostly by political environments. But during COVID, I think a lot of companies realized that they can't be dependent on a single supplier. Um, I read uh, the example about Volvo in Sweden and Sweden didn't go into a hard lockdown like we did. But still, the supply chain was impacted and they couldn't keep their factories running because of the global supply chain impact. So I'm actually hoping that um, we will see more focus on, on um, our own local, local um, retailers and companies saying we're going to use a local supply in the future. So those are a couple of the trends that, that we've been thinking about. And I think as PwC, there's one thing that's important to us, and that is um, you know, as an economics team where we're involved with Business for South Africa and, and other players, that we actually want to build a better economy than the one that we have at the moment. Uh, we want to build back better. It's a, it's a phrase that's become commonplace um, in the global economy to say that, you know, we don't want to go back to the economy that we had before COVID because that was one that, um, you know, where we saw profound um, inequalities in the economy. We saw tension uh, between different um, countries, uh, if you think about the US and China. So we actually want, want to build a better economy. So um, first of all, we, we first want to look at the repair of our own economy. Um, how do we improve our structural resilience? And we're still very much in this repair phase. If we think about where our economy is, we Sorry, very much still in the midst of the COVID impact. Yes, the economy slowly but surely started to open up, uh, but there are still some sectors of the economy that is not operating at 100% capacity. Um, I mean, Tom just mentioned, you know, even at the ports or if you look at the mines, uh, due to social distancing and and um, uh, making sure that staff is safe from COVID, it's just not possible to operate at 100% capacity. I actually read an, an article that was in The Economist a few, few weeks ago, and they're talking about an, the 90% economy where they're basically saying, even if everything is still opened up or is already opened up, we are probably going to continue operating at about 90% of our economic capacity for, for about the next year or two, given that there are certain sectors that will still continue to be impacted by, by COVID. So, how would the potential recovery look like? Um, we, you probably, um, as the audience, have heard about this V-shaped, U-shaped, W-shaped, and the L-shaped scenarios. The W-shaped one, one that's stuck out its head over the last couple of weeks to say that, you know, if we if we might have um, a return of 
or an increase in COVID cases again, um, that could lead to another contraction in the economy before we recover. At this point in time, we are hoping that these flare-ups that we're seeing, uh, for example, in Germany and in Spain, et cetera, will remain localized. So that it's only local communities, et cetera, where we're seeing um, the increase in the COVID cases and the impact of that could be contained. But suppose we see a, a next round, um, then we could very well see the so-called W-shaped recovery. So maybe just to look at the V-shaped recovery, that's we're saying big shock, quick, quick uh, you know, quick, Turn around and then things bounce back, and then we we return to to where we were pre-COVID. Um, there's some discussions of whether or not China is heading there. It's definitely looking like that from the numbers that we see coming out. In fact, we were pretty surprised by the quarter two growth numbers to the upside, and I think it's good news uh, because with China being the second largest economy globally, um, that would mean potentially a return in 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 demand, but and that's where the, where the challenge comes in. China's manufacturing output actually returned to normal levels, but their own consumption demand hasn't done that. So it's a little bit of, a, of an imbalance in terms of the recovery of the economy. And if, that, if we can't correct that imbalance, maybe this V-shaped recovery that we thought we might have um, might not be sustained. And also it depends on the demand for Chinese goods from the rest of the world. We think most likely we are heading for a U-shaped recovery globally, where you know it takes some time, about two years for us to get back to, to the normal levels of output. And you'll see that for South Africa, we're thinking two to three years. In a worst case scenario, five years, we don't wanna go there, but between two to three years before us to get back to, to our previous levels of output. I already spoke about the W-shape. That's when we might have another outbreak of, of COVID-19 cases that might impact the economy. An L-shaped scenario we really want to avoid. That is where we get stuck on a lower level of output permanently. So business confidence doesn't return, consumer confidence doesn't improve. We see um, investment and our export rates um, not improving uh, over a long period of time. So yes, we do know even in a U-shaped recovery, it will take some time, but we really don't want to get in a permanent lower level of growth. And for South Africa at the moment, our growth potential um, before COVID was about one and a half percent, which is really not where we want to be. So we, we really don't want to get to a situation where it's lower than that. And I will get into that a little bit later. So some figures that we're just keeping track of in terms of what's happening in the economy. And uh, by the way, Andrea, I think the slides will, uh, we, can, we can happily share the slides with, uh, with the people on the call. I'm happy for you to do that. So um, uh, you don't have to scramble to write down these numbers if you're on the call. But it's just to show um, you know, where the economy is heading. And as you see, there's a lot of red. So it moves from green to yellow to quite dark red. But there are some, some areas where we're starting to see an improvement as the June numbers come through. Unfortunately, um, certain indicators we don't have beyond April as yet, because in some instances, stats is they can't do their normal surveys like they like they always do uh, due to you know COVID. So we're waiting for some of these numbers, but we're seeing some improvements. If you look at retail sales, for example, you know that minus 50.4 in April, and then an improvement to minus 12 in May. So it's still down on a year-on-year -year basis, but you know it's it's starting to turn the tide. Um, the same if we look at mining sales, it's just in the black block above that. And transactions volumes and transactions um, values, that's also starting to improve. So we are definitely seeing a turnaround as the economy started to come out of the lockdown with things improving. I suppose we'll just have to see um, you know, where it ends up, where it ends up eventually. Um, I'm sure all of you, I thought I'll sneak this in uh, because everybody is quite quite curious about the IMF loan and if there's specific questions later, we can we can chat about that. But this particular loan that we um, that we received from the IMF and we will receive from the IMF um, is actually part of what they call the RFI, Rapid Financing Instrument. So it's not the normal IMF bailout um, that we would get um, under, I'm going to say, normal circumstances, because getting an IMF loan is, is never normal circumstances. There's a special facility that the IMF made available for countries that wanted to, to respond to, to COVID-19. So we actually got the, the, the maximum amount that we are allowed to get. 
um, and we receive the maximum amount. And you can see there from the countries that have actually applied for this also, um, it's by far the largest uh, loan. But, um, you know, relative to, to some of the other facilities that the, R, uh, the IMF sometimes make available and the so-called IMF bailouts, um, this is not um, massive. But in terms of this facility, uh, we went for the max that we could. And uh, it comes at a reasonable interest rate. Um, and uh, our repayments, uh, it uh, will start around 2023 and continues, it will continue to 2027. So we're getting at it at quite a reasonable rate. I suppose everybody's challenge and questions are whether or not these mo this money will go to the right place. And we actually received confirmation yesterday. We, initially, we weren't clear about how this will be monitored, but that South Africa, on a quarterly basis, has to provide feedback to the IMF about how this money has been spent and where it's going. So I'm hoping that that will, uh, you know, enable us to make sure that it goes to the right places. Um, so. How do we think? Oops, sorry. How do we think um, the impact on the economy would look like? Um, so, our base case forecast for this year is a contraction of 9.5%. Uh, so, if you look on the on the top left hand side there, um, the yellow bars, that's our base case. And then you see that there's quite a bounce next year. You know, quite a big um, recovery. And it looks there for you know like everything is good and well and um, we will be back into positive territory, but the, the truth is we won't. So that you can see very clearly on the graph right next to it. Um, and I'm, I call our, I'm calling the South African recovery a Nike swoosh recovery. So not a U or a V or an L shape. It looks a little bit like a Nike swoosh if you look at that. So what that tells us, 100, the 100 days we indexed uh, GDP output, that's where we were at the end of 2019 and you know, what we produced in the economy. And for us to make up that lost production and to return to where we are, or were before, before COVID, will take anywhere between two to five years. So don't be misled by the growth. Of course, um, you know, we hope we can continue with that, but um, don't be misled by that. Uh, it will still take two to, to five years. Um, then moving on to jobs, between 1.2 1, 1 and 1.5 million jobs we expect to be lost this year, unfortunately, due to COVID. And again, anywhere between two to five years to get back to our original levels of output. So um, what, do we, what do we need to do to transition the economy and really change it? Um, according to us, there's a couple of broad buckets. First of all, fiscal sustainability and achieving fiscal sustainability, making sure that we get policy certainty uh, continuing to attract foreign direct investment, looking at Africa trade, building a competitive business environment, making sure that we have the right skills, addressing poverty and inequality, um, looking at reindustrialization and localization, and we've spoken about that already, innovation and digitalization, and then transitioning to a sustainable economy. So we've done quite a bit of analysis around each of these areas. And um, if you look at how Something like FDI, for example, can contribute to uh, GDP growth. Um, research has shown, and you know, we did quite an, a bit of empirical analysis and research, that for every 1% that FDI increase, you can add 0.5% um, to GDP growth. So we took all of these different initiatives and we said, if we are able for each of these um, to just improve by 1% over the next 10 years, and I mean, if, we, if we're able to do that, these are really structural changes that we can make in the economy. If we're able to continue doing that for the next 10 years, where will we end up? And we believe that if we're able to do that, we can change that growth that's stuck at around 1.5% and was at 1.5% pre-COVID um, to around 4.5% um, going on to 5%. And that's the real structural changes that we need to make in the economy. I'm not going to focus on all of them. I'm, I'm just very briefly going to go through one or two. Um, what we see here, the yellow line, is um, is business confidence that we just, um, you know, uh, uh, put a fit through it. And policy uncertainty is the is the red line. So what we're saying here is the higher le the levels of policy uncertainty in the economy, the lower the levels of business confidence. So for governments, it's really important to make sure that they provide 
um, certainty for businesses to enable them to invest. Uh, very quickly here, we just had a look at, um, at our ease of doing business scores. And one particular area that I want to focus on is here starting a business where we are ranked um, 130 and ninth out of 180 countries in terms of ease of starting a business. And this is another area where, where you know, if you want to make a 1% improvement in your ability or your ranking uh, in, in the doing business ranking in terms of starting a business, it may, makes a 0.25 percentage uh, points change to, to GDP uh, growth. So, you know, another factor, as I said earlier, that's, that, that we need to address and look at. Um, then also creating an uh, environment for innovative companies to flourish. We spoke about digitalization and how important that is, but we also want to build um, those innovative companies that um, uh, thrive in the platform economy and thrive in this digital economy. And the two things that are most important there is that there's backing in terms of finance, and then also that we uh, support these uh, businesses through providing the right skills, um, and to make sure that companies embrace these disruptive ideas. So, you know, for South Africa, it's it's really important that we build more businesses that are successful over over the long run. And for that, you know, financing and skills, and having the right policy and regulation in place is is crucial. Um, also, if we look at uh, entrepreneurship, um, you know, specific areas there we we where we're really not doing too well. As you can see there, uh, skills in particular, an area in terms of startup skills, where, uh, where we are, need to improve. Um, and now, what is going on with, oh, there we go. So that was my last slide. So as I said, um, we, you know, we, we looked at all these different factors that we listed, and we really do think those are the things that will transform the economy. By the way, one that I didn't focus on, but that is crucial uh, for our competitiveness is uh, supplying electricity. And I think for a lot of you that are in the manufacturing side of, of um, the economy, you would understand how important that is. And in fact, that's one of the factors. Um, there was a research piece that was done by a group of researchers at, um, at UCT, and they actually found that that's one of the most important, uh, having reliable electricity supply, one of the most important factors for economic growth in South Africa. And um, it's also one of the factors that we took into account when looking at, you know, transforming the economy and how do we move from this one and a half percent long term growth or even below that where we stuck to the to the four or five percent um, that we envisioned in the NDP. I'm going to stop there and maybe we have a minute or two for questions. Thank you so much, Lulu. That was extremely interesting. And um, like you said, we'll we'll share the slides afterwards. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, please feel free to, to drop it in the Q&A box. Um, I can give some polling feedback in the meantime while we're waiting for, for questions. Um, so I was asked, I asked about the, the, um, the pricing strategy and whether the business has changed it. And we see majority um, said no. Then asked about you have a, your business invest in any climate change um, initiatives, and the majority said yes, which is fantastic. And then also asked about has your business automated any functions or processes during this time? And they almost everybody said yes. So we can definitely see that is a trend. Um, another question was is your business considering making re remote working a semi permanent option? Um, they, it was between yes and partly, and the other question was, has your business introduced new enhanced products or services due to COVID? And majority said no. Um, so that is from, from our side. I don't see any questions. Uh, the one person just said hi. Don't know whether you've been typing perhaps. <laughs> so we'll maybe give you a couple of seconds to continue. Yeah, right, thank you. Um, thank you, Andrea. Um, and Lulu, thank you for that presentation. Um, yeah, I know there's a lot more uh, in that, but uh, certainly those points that you've, you, you know, that you've, you spoke to um, are critical to our success. I think the one thing that stands out for me, um, and Tom also spoke about that, is you know, the opportunity that we have, we as a, 
as a country um, have to you know, reinvent ourselves and you know the the crisis it, it creates opportunities and you know if we have an environment where um, innovation is fostered and uh, you know entrepreneurial entrepreneurship um, you know can 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 grow and uh, you know it certainly bodes well for us um, you know in, in in the longer term so you know it's organisations you know like Tom's business um, and other family businesses and you know of those of you that are on the call that certainly you know, it's the the engine room of our economy and of any economy in in the world. So, um, you know, thanks for sharing your insights with us, Tom. And you know, again, very well done on the success of your business. You know, just one thing that I also reflected on what you mentioned. You know, there are two families that are working together. You know, in your in your business, and yeah, you know, it's not often that you find where two families work together that there's you know a lot of synergy. But it certainly sounds like there is um, in your organisation which is evident in the success of your business. So well done and uh, um, congratulations on that. So I think that brings us to the end of our um, of our session today um, and also to the end of our um, you know, 12th week um, uh, uh, you know, virtual conference, but you know, certainly look out for future sessions. Um, we're not going to, to stop this. Um, the thing that we Want to focus on next time, you know, specifically around family business is next, you know, next gen or next generation. So be on a lookout for invitation for that, and we will continue with our PwC family business lunch hour. Uh, maybe not in two weeks' time, but certainly, um, you know, within the next month. So thank you again for everybody attending today. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Lulu, um, and thank you, Andrea. And uh, with that, we will close the session today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone.